Cora TV. The world is thinking. So first, let me read you a passage about Maida Patkar. I first saw her uh, at a something called the World Water Forum, which was organized by the World Bank. This was in 2000 in The Hague. And she was appearing there with Arundhati Roy, who many of you probably know, a writer who won the Booker Prize uh, for The God of Small Things, and has been a great supporter of Maida, and in fact gave the money that she won in that award to Maida's organization. And at first, when I saw the two of them together, I was more impressed by Arundhati Roy uh, than Maida. Arundhati is, uh, you know, is very cosmopolitan and speaks beautiful English and is quite beautiful herself uh, and very impressive in ways that Maida is not. Maida was formal, ideological, impersonal, and unceasingly serious. She was the frumpy, graying scold in the faded sari. Many of her comments took the form of denunciations of dams, the World Bank, globalization, all pieces of what I later understood as the Andalans Gandhian, Chomskyan, feminist, Mother Teresan worldview. She did not flirt. She made no one smile. Her speeches were variations on the little engine that could. She spoke softly at first, as if headed uphill, then huffed and puffed, seeming to draw energy from the act of oration until the pistons churned and her hoarse voice grew loud and the accusations flew. She said privatization didn't acknowledge the contribution of local people, the people who tended the forest and got displaced by dams because they weren't investors. She said privatization rewarded cash crops, which meant that poor people who depended on subsistence agriculture, went hungry. Nearly yelling, she said, states now are puppets of the World Bank and the International Monetary, Monetary Fund. Then the mountain climbed, the point made, she stopped. It wasn't until a year later, when I spent a month in Cape Town, the headquarters of the World Commission on Dams, that I began to suspect I'd gotten things backward. The commission secretariat members were mostly water experts, few of whom believed that the dam debate was as one-sided as Maida did, and they weren't noted particularly for humility or guilelessness. Yet they spoke about Maida with awe, a hint of reverence, as if simultaneously acknowledging her stature and vulnerability. Everyone called her by her first name. Even the engineers and capitalists across the ideological abyss who are as enthusiastically pro-dam as Maida is anti, treated her gently. It was understandable, they said, that Maida would fight for displaced people, but their plight did not invalidate dams. Most people spoke of her toughness, her determination, her willingness to suffer. I learned that Maida declined to eat her meals during a flight to a commission meeting in Cairo and gave the food to Cairo street children after disembarking. I was told that Maida attended one commission session immediately after a week-long hunger strike and threw up everything she ate. A staff member eventually found her some plain yogurt, which she kept down. And I was told that during the heated last weeks of negotiations over the commission's final report, Maida was the only commissioner who won as the price of her signature the placement of an individual comment at the report's end in which he bemoaned the commission's refusal to consider Dam's relation to the, quote, unjust and destructive dominant development model, unquote, globalization. Of the commissioners, Maida was the best known, the most outspoken, the most politically sharply defined, yet against all the odds, she was the most admired and in a certain way cared for. <coughs> the impression I gleaned from the staff members in Cape Town was that while Arundhati Roy wrote passionately about the immorality of the Narmada Dam project, Maida embodied morality.